everyone. Nice being here. I see that Corey did her research on me. <laughs> oh, yes. Right. Um, so I'm here to present on polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a very common issue that we see in Trinidad and Tobago and also internationally. Um, the reason why we chose this topic is because in the previous presentations that we had, a number of persons reached out to both Corey and I and wanted this topic presented. So we are going to go straight to the presentation and I'm going to share my screen. Just a moment. It's starting soon, but I'm very happy to see some of my friends and past patients. So, why? Corys? Okay. Yes, Maria. Okay, good. You're right there. Oh, you yes. Need to Everyone is seeing. Everyone is seeing. Can you either type in the chat or just? Yeah, yeah seeing. Yeah, okay, seeing. Thank yeah, you. Seeing. Yes. I was trying to magnify to play the slideshow, but let's see. So, what is PICOS? So polycystic ovarian syndrome is a serious genetic hormone, metabolic and reproductive disorder that affects women. It is the leading cause of infertility in women. So to understand polycystic ovarian syndrome is very important to understand a normal menstrual cycle that occurs each month. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties, but I'll try to. Coris, are you able to share your screen? I should be, I should be able to. Give me one second. Okay. You're getting through? Yes. All right. Ovulation is the release of an egg from one of the ovaries. It often happens about midway through the menstrual cycle, although the exact timing may vary. In preparation for ovulation, the lining of the uterus or endometrium thickens. The pituitary gland in the brain stimulates one of the ovaries to release an egg. The wall of the ovarian follicle ruptures at the surface of the ovary. The egg is released. Finger-like structures called fimbrae sweep fallopian tube, propelled in part by contractions in the fallopian tube walls. Here in the fallopian tube, the egg may be fertilized by a sperm. If the egg is fertilized, the egg and sperm unite to form a one-celled entity called a zygote. As the zygote travels down the fallopian tube toward the uterus, it begins dividing rapidly to form a cluster of cells resembling a tiny raspberry. When the zygote reaches the uterus, it implants in the lining of the uterus, and pregnancy begins. If the egg isn't fertilized, it's simply reabsorbed by the body, perhaps before it even reaches the uterus. About two weeks later, the lining of the uterus sheds through the vagina. This is known as menstruation. So this is very different from what occurs in ladies that have polycystic ovarian syndrome. In women with PCOS, multiple small follicles, these are, these are accumulated in the ovary and none of these small follicles are capable of growing into a size that will trigger the ovulation from occurring. As a result, the levels of the hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, 
luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone become imbalanced. And with polycystic ovarian syndrome, there is an increase in the male hormone androgens, and this has to do with the increase of the luteinizing hormone. The cause of polycystic ovarian syndrome is, is unknown, and there's a genetic component like fibroids. So daughters of women with polycystic ovaries are at an increased risk of developing PCOS. A hormone imbalance causes the symptoms of PCOS similar to fibroids, which are growths that are linked to estrogen dominance. In PCOS, we see where there is insulin resistance. This means that the body cannot use insulin properly. Now, insulin is the hormone that regulates blood sugar levels. So if insulin, the hormone, isn't functioning properly, then this can increase your risk of developing diabetes. And high testosterone, is also seen in polycystic ovaries, which is an increase in the male hormones. Now, who has polycystic ovarian syndrome? So PCOS affects five to 15% of all women of childbearing age. So one in every 10 women are affected. In African-American females, we see where there is an 8% of females with PCOS. In Latina, there's 13%. And in Caucasians, there's 4.8%. In comparison to fibroids, which sees around one in three women developing them at some point in their life, and Black women being most affected. So how is PCOS diagnosed? So in the medical field, we use what is called a Rotterdam criteria. So the Rotterdam criteria, where there is presence of any two of the following criteria. So polycystic ovaries being one, either 12 or more follicles measuring two to nine millimeters in diameter on ultrasound, and also where the ladies have a period of irregular cycles or reduced periods where there's failure to, re to um, release the eggs, and also hyperandrogenism, which is excessive male hormone, which is seen clinical or, bi or by biochemical evidence. In biochemical evidence, certain blood tests are done. These tests test for androgens and also testosterones. So this is a diagram showing uh, an ovary with polycystic ovaries. Well, there are more than 12 follicles. So it is very important to understand that not all women with PCOS have polycystic ovaries. And not all polycystic ovaries are caused by PCOS. So greater than 20% normal women have incidental findings of polycystic ovaries. This is very important because when the sonographer does the ultrasound and then gives the report to the young lady to go by the gynecologist, now some of the sonographers normally write polycystic ovarian syndrome, but what they should really put is polycystic ovaries. And then with the Rotterdam criteria, then we will determine if the lady actually has polycystic ovarian syndrome or just have polycystic ovaries. So the transvaginal ultrasound is a preferred method, mainly because with abdominal ultrasounds, you are unable to actually see the ovaries clearly in some ladies. So these two diagrams show a normal size ovary on the left and the normal size ovaries are usually small and yellow and pale in color whereas with polycystic ovaries it's normally pearly white smooth and enlarged and thick walled ovary so the core symptoms and signs of polycystic ovarian syndrome include irregular or absent period and this is the most common symptom and also the main deferring symptom of women with fibroids. Infertility, remember we said that PCOS is a leading cause of infertility in women. Abnormal bleeding, this is definitely seen in ladies with PCOS and this has to do with women who normally have missed periods say for three, four, five months and then the lining of the uterus begins to build up and then eventually it sheds after some months. 
then they present with heavy bleeding and then can present to the hospital with symptoms or signs of anemia and they may um, require blood transfusion. So acne is another common symptom of ladies with PCOS. Acne affects 15 to 25 percent of PCOS patients and it primarily affects the face and less often the back and the chest. Hirsutism. So 80% of females with PCO suffer with hirsutism. And this is the presence of terminal hair in a female body in a male type pattern. This includes hair on nine body areas, the upper lip, the chin, the chest, the upper back, the lower back, the upper and lower abdomen, and the upper arm and thigh. Mm. So obesity. Prevalence of obesity varies from 30 to 75%. It is a common symptom. So two thirds of patients with PCOS who are not obese still have excessive body fat and sensual fat. Acanthosis nigrans is also a common sign and this is noticed by patches of dark skin on the back of the neck or other areas of the body. Alopecia or non-scarring hair loss occurs in 10% of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. In terms of the clinical presentation of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, it can be divided in terms of adolescence, reproductive age, and menopausal women. So in terms of the teenage years, you see ladies normally coming in with having irregular periods. Also, they have cosmetic concerns because of acne, the hirsutism, and also hair loss. In the reproductive age group, we see where infertility is the number one um, symptom or sign, and also ladies present with early pregnancy loss as well. During pregnancy, PCOS also increases your risk of developing pregnancy-induced hypertension and also gestational diabetes. In menopausal women, there is a risk of metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions that occur together, increasing your risk of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and stroke. Also, the risk of endometrial cancer is high as well in these women. And we see that obesity is the number one factor that occurs in the all age groups. So, as we said, PCOS increases the risk of type 2 diabetes, infertility, heart disease, certain cancers, such as endometrial cancer, which is cancer of the uterus or the womb, and also obesity and metabolic syndrome. So 33% of women with PCOS can have metabolic syndrome and obesity can be classified in either apple-shaped obesity and pear-shaped obesity. So apple-shaped obesity, this is increased fat around the belly region and it is associated with metabolic syndrome and there's more visceral fat. There's high risk of health problems with apple-shaped obesity. Whereas with pear-shaped obesity, um, this is less commonly associated with metabolic syndrome and there's excess fat around the hips and the thighs. There's less visceral fat. Therefore, there's lower risk of health problems occurring. So PCOS and infertility. Infertility is the most common medical complication associated with PCOS. It occurs in approximately 75% of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. It is seen that weight loss of 5 to 10% of body weight may improve fertility with women with PCOS. This could mean that even losing 8 pounds can make a difference. So normally we tell patients to try to lose weight either by exercising and also a change in diet. The thing with polycystic ovarian syndrome is that it also has an emotional effect on women. So some women are, they are embarrassed about their parents. Um, they are concerned about the ability to have children and Unfortunately, some women actually suffer with depression and anxiety. 
So how is PICOS treated? So PICOS is not curable like fibroids. And the symptoms of PICOS are treatable by a healthy lifestyle and maintaining a healthy weight. So the lifestyle change can also help women with fibroids to better cope as well. So it's very important once a woman is diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome that they protect or monitor their endometrium lining, meaning that an ultrasound should be done knowing um, the endometrial thickness or the lining of the endometrium and, what's, and once it's a certain thickness greater than 15 millimeters, then your doctor may offer endometrial biopsy or sampling. This is just to monitor your risk of developing endometrial cancer in the future. Also medications for regulating menstrual cycle and also to treat acne and hirsutism and hair loss. So PCOS management in terms of lifestyle, as we said, so a healthy diet. So limit foods with added sugar, such as sodas and candy. Limit processed foods, juice, cereals, can or tin foods and snacks. Eat more whole grains, lean meats, fruits and vegetables, and non-fat dairy products. In terms of physical activity, 16 minutes every day, maintain a healthy weight, and this helps to maintain a healthy weight and also helps with depression and anxiety. So in terms of the medical management, hormonal contraceptives is also given for ladies with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So low dose of oral contraceptives are effective in treating acne and hirsutism. It is seen that a minimum of two years and cosmetic measures are needed to achieve good results. It also manages irregular menstrual cycles. So normally with patients who we see that have irregular cycles, we normally put them on a low dose oral contraceptive pills. For ladies who present to the hospital in the acute setting with prolonged and heavy bleeding, we normally give them Provera which is periodic progesterone withdrawal. So they would take Provera for over like seven to 21 days to stop the bleeding. And this actually helps to thin the lining. Sometimes we actually give Provera for a longer course. The other medical management include metformin. So metformin is an anti-diabetic drug and this improves the metabolic abnormalities associated with PCOS and may improve menstrual cycle and the potential for pregnancy. So one thing with metformin, some patients stop taking the course of metformin because of the side effects. The side effects include nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal discomfort. Clomid is a fertility drug. So this is a non-steroidal weak estrogen. It's normally started on either the second, third, fourth, or fifth day and given for five days. With Clomid, it sees that there's an 80% chance of ovulation and then a 60% chance of getting pregnant. If all medical management has failed and for women who want to get pregnant, then the, res the um, last resort will be laparoscopic ovarian drilling. So it's sometimes used for women with PCOS who are still not ovulating and are trying weight loss and fertility medicine. So we have seen that with 50% of women, they may be able to, to become pregnant after they have this procedure. And this is also done in Tobago under um, Dr. Wheeler. And we've seen with patients that we did laparoscopic ovarian drilling that they actually got pregnant. The thing with ovarian drilling is to note that you're actually using the diathermy. It's a sharp pointed heated instrument that actually bursts the follicles, but you cannot over drill the ovaries because you, um, because you will be damaging ovarian tissue. So it's very important for the surgeon to note that at least five to six holes should be drilled. So this is the presentation of polycystic ovaries. And at this point in time, we can engage in questions and answers. I hope that it was simple and everyone understood. Oh. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Could you 
Uba. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. Could you talk about the difference between um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and polycystic ovaries. You could just go over. Right. Uh, right. So that's a good question. Okay. So in some women who have polycystic ovaries, they don't have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So they do not meet the criteria. So these women, they just went and do a random ultrasound and there was an incidental finding that they have polycystic ovaries, but they don't have the symptoms associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is irregular periods and problems with ovulation, as well as acne, hirsutism, obesity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else with questions? The floor is literally open. Maria, you Hello. Can Hi, good morning. Welcome. Morning. Morning. I'm Shanta. My question is basically, I've been through the process, and when I go to the dietitian, they basically just prescribe a general um, diet plan, and that doesn't really help me in no kind of way to lose weight, even with regular exercise. So how do I jumpstart a healthy metabolism rate to actually lose the weight? And my other question is, I usually go to Dr. Wheeler for a regular checkup. I even have to go to D. He said my endometrial thickness is 2.0 centimeters. So... Is that an issue or? <laughs> okay, Chantel. So I tackle both questions. Thank you for these questions. Um, the thing is with dieting and exercise, normally it's a type of exercise you do or how long you do it. So some people engage in walking and and um, research has shown that walking actually helps to burn fat, but it's how long you walk for and in terms of, if you're actually doing weight strengthening as well. So some people, they just do aerobics and they see effects from that. Whereas with other people, just by doing aerobics, their body um, doesn't show a difference and they're not able to lose weight. So it's just a matter of you finding out what exercise program works with you. And in terms of losing weight um, via dieting, it all has to do with a calorie deficit. So I'm not sure what type of diet plan the dietitian has you on, but that's the number one goal, that whatever you eat or whatever you consume each day, it should be in a calorie deficit. If um, I could go on, um, Shanta, as it relates to the getting a metabolic rate up, if you are having challenges with one dietitian, you may have to seek an expert opinion from someone else. And if I can put a plug in, I'm actually seeing Jehan here, Jehan Baptiste. Um, she is very much into fitness. She might be a good resource person to help you pinpoint where you may need to change your approach, right? Because we know with exercise, you can plateau, so you can start and then you reach a point where you're not losing any more weight or it doesn't have an impact on the body. And that's because the body has plateaued and so you need mm -hmm. to change it. Yeah, so you could look, just as we encourage as it relates to fibroids and getting second opinions and, and knowing your body, you can also do the same as it relates to diet and advice related to your diet. Yeah. We have yes. a question. Um, we have one more question. So in terms oh, of endometrial thickness. thickness. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Shantan, I haven't forgotten you. So in terms of the endometrial thickness, that is very thickened. And knowing Dr. Wheeler, he would suggest that you do an endometrial biopsy. So this yes, can be done by a dilatation and curettage or by PIPEL. So PIPEL is actually not as vigorous as a DNC. <laughs> it's actually a small plastic tube that you insert into the uterus and you take some of the sample to test. And he might even put you on oral contraceptive pills that actually help to thin the lining. So good question. I hope you a understand. A question that came in, Marielle, from one Cassie is, can PCOS cause severe pain whilst ovulating? 
I love that question because actually does not cause pain. Because the cysts are very small, they are very tiny. So, and this is a normal complaint from a lot of women that come to the hospital when they are seen in accidents and emergency. They have polycystic ovarian syndrome and they are having pelvic pains. But polycystic ovaries do not cause pain. What could happen is that one of the cysts can develop into a complex cyst. And that complex cyst is what causes the pain. So complex cysts, like I know Chevy always asks about dermoid cysts and other types of ovarian cysts, once they are larger than five centimeters, they can cause pains. And remember, um, in females, there are other causes for pelvic pain. So it could be actually due to a pelvic inflammatory disease, as we said, a complex ovarian cyst. Um, it can also be due to hydrosalpings, which is a swelling in the fallopian tubes. So if any woman um, have a symptom of pelvic pains, then, then, then an ultrasound should be done and they should have a physical examination um, by the gynecologist because it's not going to be due to polycystic ovarian syndrome unless there's one complex cyst that is growing. Another question that came in, Marielle, relates to getting pregnant after drilling. How long after should you or can you? We normally tell patients to wait at least um, three to six months after the ovarian drilling to okay. see the effects. All right. And as it relates to the chances of becoming pregnant, having one ovary, picos, and fibroids. <laughs> what a difficult question. So I'm not a fertility specialist as yet. Um, but you said one ovary, picos. Oh, and fibroids. once you are ovulating, even though you have one ovary and that ovary has polycystic ovaries or has small cysts or small follicles, once you are ovulating, there is still a chance. And remember, fibroids can only cause infertility depending if that fibroid is actually blocking your um, fallopian tube or if that fibroid is actually prolapsing into your cervix, pre preventing the sperms from entering your uterus. So there is a possibility that you can still become pregnant. We just need to start the ovulation process. And by starting the ovulation process, then the doctor may give you Clomid. So with ladies who want to become pregnant, oral contraceptive pills is not the choice because oral contraceptive pills is, is, is I'm going to prevent you from becoming pregnant. So therefore, we're going to start it, lifestyle changes, Clomid, and see if ovulation begins. All right, so we have a question as it relates to the correlation between that fancy H word. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. But um, that hirsutism? Yes, hirsutism. Oh. <laughs> hirsutism oh. and hippos. Um, I think that person probably, can, because you did mention that. Oh, she, yes. Yes? Yeah. But you could go ahead for her. Um. Okay. Just so I do not mix up the statistics. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's before that. Mm -hmm. So, right. So, hirsutism is very common with ladies with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So, 80% of ladies can have hirsutism. All right. Is there a correlation between you PCOS and UTIs? Uterine tract infections for those who may not be sure what UTI is. No, polycystic ovarian syndrome shouldn't cause UTIs. Normally, you will normally see an increase in urinary tract infections with ladies with fibroids, especially large fibroids, because normally the fibroids can compress the bladder and that causes stasis of the urine. Um, so therefore, increased amount of bacteria. So you will see a correlation between fibroids and and recurrent UTIs, but not from my knowledge with fibroids and PCOS. All right. So the questions are rolling in. Um, I like Donna, it. I have a question. I'm here to share with you. Um, that's the one who asked about the hirsutism. Um, we have three questions that came in. 
and I know somebody's also lined up to ask a question for themselves. Marian, if you could take a mental note or just pass to the chat, how dangerous are calcified fibroids and can they be disintegrated? What type of ultrasound should be done if there's intense pelvic pain? So this is a broad question. Following the ultrasound, what should be the next step? Um, options for ovulation, if clomid or metformin does not work. I'll stop there and then we, we could ask the other questions because I don't want to lose them. Yeah? Um, chat. Okay. Yeah. And the person who wants to ask the question, you could go ahead and ask your question. Oh, Shania? Is that Shania? Shania, yes. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Morning, everybody. Um, with regards to the size of ovaries, is it that um, I have one that is approximately twice the size of the other, and I want to know if it's the cyst themselves caused it to be that big, or it was um, big from the, or if the enlargement caused the cyst, or okay. Or that so in terms of diagnosing polycystic ovarian syndrome on ultrasound, in terms of diagnosing polycystic ovaries there's also the increase in volume of the ovaries because the cysts or the number of cysts can cause an increase in the volume of the ovary, therefore making that ovary larger than the right ovary, if it's the left ovary being large. Yeah, is it left? And oh, is it also right? <laughs> Yeah, like really bad pain on, on the left side also when I'm menstruating. So I don't know if the size is what causes any pain or... Or what? Because I saw somebody ask if ovulation caused pain, and I was going and asked that too. So. Ovulation oh, so. causes pain. So yes, women experience ovulating pain. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, I was trying to go into the chat because there were a few questions that were coming in. All right, so we could start from the top, right? The first one is not directly people. How dangerous are calcified fibroids and can they be disintegrated? Oh, so calcified fibroids are normally seen in menopausal women and these are not dangerous. And this has to do with, the, with um, the, the, um, decreased blood supply and also decreased estrogen levels in menopausal women. In terms of this integrated, I'm not sure if I quite understand if it's... If they will, I, I'm not sure if the person is asking if they will just disintegrate on their own. Or like disappear. Yeah, no, they'll just stay there. No, they'll just stay there classified and become small and not bothering. Yeah. Uh, if I can also jump in, um, calcified fibroids really for their blood supply, right? Yeah. So they kind of dry and calcify means they get hard, they no longer feel, so they won't affect you to cause symptoms, but they will. And I guess that's why Dr. Armstrong shared that calcified fibroids usually affect menopausal women, but even in, in my personal case, some of the fibroids were growing so rapidly that they outgrew the blood supply, and so I also had calcified fibroids that were just there. So disintegrating, not necessarily, um, but they are not dangerous to the point that they may cause problems. If you have other fibroids, those are the ones that may be causing the, the signs and symptoms that you're experiencing. Um, I want to answer the question with what type of ultrasound should be done if there is intense pain? Yes. Following the ultrasound, what should be the next step? Honestly, once dealing with females, and if you want to know a lot about what's going on in the pelvis, even if you have an intense pelvic pain, I would suggest that you are given analgesia or pain medication, and that we gently proceed with a transvaginal ultrasound, meaning that, the ultra, meaning that the ultrasound probe is passed through the vagina, because this actually, you get to see your pelvic organs properly, so you get to see your ovaries and... If there's any large cysts on your ovaries, you get to see your fallopian tubes properly if there's any swelling. And it's good when you see your fallopian tubes as well because it actually gives you an idea if there 
if you have any pelvic, any pelvic infections, because in terms of health, in terms of pelvic inflammatory diseases, it's seen that there's what you call hydrosalping, so swelling of the tubes. That's also a common sign with ladies having pelvic inflammatory disease. If you have a gynecological finding, you must see a gynecologist. And one second. One second. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, and after doing an ultrasound, it, um, you must see a gynecologist to be examined and to be treated. But definitely intense pelvic pain because the thing with abdominal ultrasounds, how ultrasounds work is that the sound waves have to pass through your abdominal fat. And if you're a little bit thick, then you wouldn't be able to see down in the pelvis properly and your ovaries and some ovaries could be hiding behind bowel could be hiding behind something so once you do transvaginal ultrasound we see your ovaries we see your fallopian tubes clearer all right so we move on to the next question um, options for ovulation if clomid or metformin doesn't work Not right sure if through and what there are other medications internationally and but the other best option is the surgical management of the laparoscopic ovarian drilling, right? And this increases your chances of ovulating. So once metformin and clomid doesn't work because that's the drugs that we have in Trinidad and Tobago, then the doctor normally moves on to laparoscopic ovarian drilling. And this increases your risk of having to ovulate. Okay. Um, treatment for hirsutism. Okay, so treatment for hirsutism. So it's normally seen that once you, well, cosmesis in terms of laser treatment. Okay. All right. Um, one person asked about geriatric pregnancy. About what? Is there such a thing as geriatric pregnancy? And if there is, if you could um <laughs> you're going deep in fertility geriatric oh, Being no. up age. <laughs> walking into destiny yeah maria go ahead <laughs> well once you're still seeing your period if you're 50 and above and still seeing your period there's always a chance of getting pregnant because once you see your period that means that you are ovulating i see my friend betty ann bigot hi betty ann so I want to do this. So I had a roommate who told me she had picosis. So she had severe stomach cramps that would make her have to stoop in the road. She eventually got pregnant and had two children. Sorry, my comment was broken up. She was also overweight. I guess God really moved on her behalf as she did not do any treatment. Right, but remember I said that even if you have polycystic ovaries, that don't mean to say that you have a syndrome. That's Once right. you are ovulating, then you can have children. And that is always, uh, that's always the, the thing that kind of confuses a lot of people because they're like, I have polycystic ovaries, so therefore I should have the syndrome. I should have irregular periods. I should be a certain weight, but it's not that. It's two out of three to uh, meet the criteria. Even with ladies without the cysts on the ovaries, but have an ovulation, meaning that they aren't ovulating and also have an increase in male hormones, they are in that category of having polycystic ovarian syndrome without the cysts. You see, so one thing we try to really advance through fibroid awareness, Trinidad and Tobago, is staying away from self-diagnosis because that's something we're very good at in this space. And so we self-diagnose and we declare because um, we have cysts, we have PCOS. Cysts and PCOS are two different things. And I don't think Dr. Armstrong and I could stress sufficiently this morning, ensure that you get feedback, you get the expert opinion of a specialist. She, she mentioned that persons do ultrasounds and the technicians write PCOS. Because of that, you run with it. Not because you have cysts, it means that you have 
polycystic ovarian syndrome. So we're really stressing that point this morning. Also, similarly with fibroids, that self-diagnosing and declaring because you have fibroids, that's the reason why you're not able to get pregnant. PCOS actually has a higher risk of infertility than fibroids. Fibroids can pose a challenge as it relates to infertility based on where the fibroid is located and the size of the fibroid. I'm actually seeing a number of persons here who reached out to us who had fibroids and had full pregnancies. Some have been high risk, some have had no risk. Yes, and when I say that they had an uneventful pregnancy, but if you have fibroids, doctors, Maria can correct me, doctors will tell you, okay, you're at risk because you present with fibroids. However, you can have fibroids and conceive and carry a baby full term. So we were encouraging you this morning not to self-diagnose, but to get the expert opinion of your preferred specialist, not even an, an ultrasound technician, but an actual specialist, a fertility specialist or your gynecologist, right? Um, I have a question. Marielle, someone, sure. I just wanted to get to a question that came through on the comment, uh, on the chat that speaks to the possible implications of PCOS. Um, on mental health, apart from depression and anxiety, right, of the person having anxiety or depression, but as it relates to the hormones also affecting, affecting your emotions because of a hormonal imbalance. I'm not sure if you could speak to that. That is Dr. true. Sorry. That is true. Um, so polycystic ovarian syndrome is associated with inflammatory processes that occurs in the body. And this high inflammation also increases your cortisol levels. And your cortisol levels is one of the hormones that deals with stress. So increased cortisol levels can also trigger. Um, there's an ear in the brain that, and it can also trigger you to actually suffer from depression and anxiety. So that is true. Because right. PCOS has an inflammatory process. Um, one Cassie is saying that she has to leave. Thank you so much for joining us, Cassie. Thank um, you. As we continue with the, the questions and our open chat with Dr. Armstrong. So one person wanted some clarity as it relates to laser treatment for her citizen. They, they weren't sure what you meant by laser treatment. Oh, um, well, normally in the spas, well, I know that certain spas internationally, they give um, laser treatment. So Cosmetism can be dealt with cosmesis management. So like waxing, um, laser treatment. Uh, can't really explain it because that's not my field, but normally spa treatment with laser. So it's a, it's a cosmetology or mm -hmm. cosmetological treatment. So you go to a spa, you go to someone who will remove the hairs by a laser. That's essentially what Dr. Armstrong is speaking to. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's for aesthetics, really. It's not like a medical treatment that you... Medical. So doctors it. don't do it. It's not, it's not a medical treatment per se, right? Um, honey, Honey York has a question. She said it's too long to type. So Honey... Hi, Honey. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, yes, I can see you. Um, <laughs> so I asked the question earlier about... Um, in the metformin and the clomid doesn't work, what other options it has, right? And you mentioned about the trillion. So my thing is, right, if you already lost one ovary, so now you only have one, like what are the, the, um, the I mean, the positive side of the drilling is that you get to ovulate, but I'm sure that it affects the ovary some, some way or the other in terms of like when it's time to conceive and stuff like that because now you only have one. So that's my 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 um, question. Honey, you asked me a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> for fertility specialist, but I will try to answer it. So in Trinidad and Tobago we know about clomid, but there are other fertility drugs. But honestly I don't know about them being in Tobago. Um, but I would always say that you seek a fertility specialist, which uh, we have in Trinidad and Barbados and in Jamaica. 
The thing about having one ovary and having ovarian drilling, I would suggest that you go by someone, well, by a doctor who will know how to do the ovarian drilling, meaning not to puncture too much holes. So because puncturing too much holes will destroy the ovarian tissue. But if the doctor just give you five holes or six holes in that one ovary, ovulation would occur and that would not affect the functioning of the ovary in terms of releasing an egg or fertilization. So it can still work. All right. Um, one question that came give up. <laughs> Thank you, honey. One question that came in, well, we have two. One related to fibroids from Eva, which we will get to. But we had one before from Shanta, which I um, spoke to her recognizing that she has both fibroids and PCOS. However, she has regular, so she's asymptomatic essentially. She says she has regular cycles, no pain before, during her menstrual, that kind of thing. Um, but she says she has only a few symptoms of people, such as the obesity and facial hair. Mm -hmm. Am I at risk? What can I do? I'm asking a question because I want to know what she's at risk. What, what risk is she asking about? Am I at risk for what? I'm not sure. So if Shanta is still here, if she could just chime in and let us know. And the other question has to do, as I said, with fibroids. Um, so Eva, anytime Fibroid Awareness Shara and Tobago has um, a session, you could always ask about fibroids, okay? Um, she knows that the main topic is PCOS. However, I had a massive fibroid and she did the abdominal myomectomy in 2018. At her last doctor visit in 2017, which is before the, the surgery, there was no sign of a fibroid. So I'm thinking here yeah, we may have a mix up in the beats. What she's saying though, by the end of September 2018, a massive one was discovered and she was encouraged to do surgery again, which she did within two weeks after discovery. Is there any explanation for the rapid growth? And is it normal? And how could it have been brought on? I'm trying to understand if the dates are correct. So I think there's an error with the dates. I think. She had no fibroids in 2017. However, by the end of September 2018, she had a massive one. All right, so you had a massive one. So you want to know what is the explanation for the rapid growth and if the growth is normal? Yeah. Well, all our bodies are different, but most times fibroids grow slowly, but it depends on what you're eating, one, and your genetic component, like in terms of your family history as well as what triggered that estrogen to be growing the fibroids as well. Because okay. estrogen, remember fibroids are estrogen dominant. So normally with this rapid growth, you normally see ladies who are pregnant or who become pregnant. They could have like a two centimeters fiber and then a fibroid grow to like nine centimeters over a couple of months. So what was the cause for the estrogen surge? And I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not um it's not it's it is abnormal to see such it is abnormal but the thing is it will be good to so find out what was the histology findings of the fibroid because fast growing fibroids can be a cause of concern yeah like leomyosarcoma which is um fibroids that become cancerous cancerous yeah so, so it's very good to know what was the histology finding of that fibroid yeah, and factors such as your age and your family history. History and, and also important. diet, everything. Yeah. Um, Betty Ann is asking, we hope that answers your question. And if you want to talk some more, Eva, you can definitely reach out to us. Um, we'll share the contact information after, right? So one person is asking, can you do drilling more than once? That's Betty Ann. And Shanta has um, conditionalized her question. She wants to know she's at risk of not being able to get pregnant due to obesity and other health-related issues. So this is a person who has oh, so PCOS and fibroids. It's linked to fertility. So I would answer Shanta. Shanta, you said that you will have that you were having regular periods. So mm -hmm. definitely you can get pregnant with having PCOS and fibroids once you have regular periods. So, so yeah, on where the fibroids are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Betty Ann asks about drilling more than once. 
do you have to drill six holes at one time or do you do three and then betty betty Ann is one of my favorite patients past patients betty Ann, i'm in clinic with you <laughs> No, I didn't mean like that, but so in terms, I mean, each ovary is supposed to drill at least five to six holes, right? At one time, meaning that on the table at surgery, right? But not drill first three holes and then later on, no. Not like that. Betty <laughs> All right. Um, Hi, Kenyan. So now... Hurry up, come back with your expert qualifications, please. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have to, okay. We're asking, oh no, sorry. That's just a general question from Donna as it relates to the presentation being available for distribution. So we've been having very exciting times behind the scenes as it relates to um, navigating Zoom. We want to sanitize the presentation hi natoya oh okay hi natoya um what we want to do is um ensure that the presentation is compact and concise so we have to do some editing and then we will share via our social media platforms and we can make available certain parts of it for persons who might be interested what we want you to do is indicate to us via our website because it's easiest to track there via subscription what you're interested in if you're interested in the presentation all right i can plug that in now the website is www.ttconfidenceproject.org i will also type it in into the chat and you can subscribe there we will be able to get your full contact information that is your email and if you share your phone number and your full name and then you can indicate if you want the presentation and also via the subscription list we also keep you updated on our upcoming sessions so we do not bombard you with information all the time but we will share with you upcoming sessions um, that you could be invited to all right so um not a question but a great job ladies and thank you looking forward to another session on fertility um I also know we had a request coming in for more information on endometriosis. And we are just excited that we are able to share the information. As I said at the outset, all focus is on awareness and advocacy. I know a question came in for us to make recommendations for gynecologists. So what I have to do is put the disclaimer out there. Fibroid Awareness Trinidad and Tobago does not recommend gynecologists, right? Because of liability reasons, we are officially registered as a nonprofit slash NGO in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And based on what we said we are registered for, referrals to specific um, specialists, are not under our remit. And for liability reasons, we do not want to say go to Dr. A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and that doctor does not meet what your expectations are, and then we are held, held culpable. So actually our website or Facebook page, anything associated with us has that disclaimer. We share the information and that's what our focus is. Maybe on a one-on-one, -on -one, if you can reach out to Dr. Armstrong privately, she might say, okay, X by Y by B the case. Same thing with Corey's X by Y be the case, but definitely fibroid awareness TT will not, will not make any re referrals to um, specialists. And that's really because of just safety and liability for the organization and ensuring that we hold fast to what we say we're doing when we registered with the Registrar of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. So I hope that helps, right? Um, yeah, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, any other questions? Um, if you feel free to ask, um, it doesn't have to be PCOS related. Yeah, I have a question. You want to ask. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, is with regards to estrogen dominance, mm -hmm. I was taking, um, evening primrose, 1,000 milligrams. 
Mm -hmm. um, in the the Seven Seas brand, the one with starflower oil, it was because I had bad acne and it cleared it up. Okay. Um, but now, after taking it, um, I was taking it for a while and then they found I had fibroids. So I wanted to know if it was due in part to the evening primrose because of the estrogen um, imbalance kind of thing. It can because since the primrose had that high, um, since the evening primrose had that high dosage of estrogen, so that would have been one of the risk factors. That that would have been a high risk factor of allowing mm -hmm. your fibroids to grow so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because since then I stopped it and I'm currently taking Vitex. So okay. Kind of help with progesterone. And how you find the acne is now? It's it it's um clearing up. It, it was really bad, like mm -hmm. really bad, like big um, pustules, bad, covered mm -hmm. like most of my face, chest, my arms, back, like, yeah, it was bad, but it's clear. Oh, okay, out. because I've seen your face very clear, so I'm trying to say, where did you get? It's like, <laughs> and plenty water, plenty <laughs> water, and lifestyle, lifestyle changes. Yes, good. <laughs> right. So good. I think um, that makes a good segue for any um, information that we share and we encourage. Yes, there is a medical side, but we really, really try to stress on the importance of lifestyle changes. And um, I think Shanta's Shanta sharing her experience and even Betty and sharing the experience of the person who didn't do any treatment but eventually got pregnant, speaks to how individualized these issues are for every person, just as there are creatures under the sun that we've never seen, so is the human race. Every individual is different. different. What will work for me may not work for someone else. So I'm seeing questions coming in as it relates to hormonal imbalance. How can I regulate it? You have to, it, it requires a full like introspection medically head to toe to know what works for you, right? And what may be triggering your hormonal imbalance. And a hormonal imbalance doesn't necessarily mean the same thing for me. A hormonal imbalance in me might mean estrogen is high and testosterone and progesterone is low. But hormonal imbalance in somebody else might mean the, the reverse. And so it's very individualized. You have to first know, do the, the requisite test. So whether it's a, a fertility specialist or a hormonal specialist to know what is going on with your hormones and then taking the steps from there. Ultimately, um, lifestyle changes. We speak about processed foods. And processed foods, anything in the tin, anything in the pack, soft drinks, um, even uh, plastic bottles that we all love. All these things, we, consume them, we consume them over time, and they may be in small doses, but those small doses over time contribute to throwing the body out of work. Doctor, I'm sure I don't know if you want to join in there. Yes, um, I just have something to say because when it comes with gynecology conditions, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to be working in the gynecology department and especially in clinic and seeing ladies coming in who are suffering from these conditions. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, they are unable to get pregnant in some ladies and they have increased weight, some of them suffering with some of them going to dietitians and not getting help. Some of them was taking metformin and it's not working. And also with endometriosis, the pains involved with endometriosis. It's just that with gyne conditions, it's not like, uh, what to say, general surgery or orthopedics. You break your foot, you go by the surgeon and he fix it. With gynecologic conditions, it takes time. It takes time. It takes work. Find a gynecologist or a doctor who you trust, who you could talk to in terms of if you have certain problems, because it does affect you in terms of your mental health. It does, because you are dealing with this as a woman. You're struggling each day. And in terms of women, we normally, um, to be honest, we um, don't like to compare our bodies, but it happens. 
and we've seen where our face has changed. We have acne now. We've seen where our, in terms of our abdomen area, it's getting fat, our clothes not fitting well, and it can affect us psychologically. And I'm a big promoter of that. If you want to talk to somebody, find a psychologist. Because yes, you're seeing a gynecologist as well, but you need someone and you may need therapy to talk about all these issues and how it is affecting you. And normally when you've been seen at the hospital, most times doctors, we don't really have the time to spend each hour, one hour on each patient. Like I could tell you from my experience, I used to take very long in my office in the clinic back home. And my nurses, they used to be like, I'm sure hurry up, you're taking too long. But then I realized that's how patients liked me and they liked coming to me because I was, I am with listen, but I can't listen for a lengthy period because I have other patients. So same way that other doctors, they can't listen for long and that's not their fault. That's just because they're working in the public sector and you have to see all the patients that are there in the afternoon and in the morning dining clinic. But we do care and we do understand, but at the same time, it's very difficult to be a woman and have a gynecological issue or condition. It's very difficult and we understand. Yes, um, I could add further um, by sharing the experience with a naturopathic doctor. So Dr. Agbeko, again, she has shared and she works with us once she's available. Um, her one visit to Dr. Agbeko may take about two hours, right? The first visit, right? And naturopathic medicine somewhat tries to give a broader picture. They may refer you back to, for example, in the case of fibroids, Dr. Agbeko says, once your fibroids get beyond a certain size, it has to be removed. There's no question about it. It has to be removed. And then you become very serious about coping through managing your lifestyle changes and being serious about it, right? Dr. Armstrong also stressed heavily on the impact on mental health. And I'm very happy that we have also started the conversation through Fibroid Awareness TT, um, the session previously that touched on men and mental health. And through that, we are actually planning the final session for this month of May is actually going to zone in on mental health. We are looking at the last Sunday in this month. We just have to firm up the time. I'm not sure how many persons who are logged on now would have joined us. For the last session, we had a certified trauma professional and a counselor, Akila Riley Richardson, and she shared very openly with the men and the women who participated in the last session. Um, if I can share, Akila is the very first person that Fibroid Awareness TT counseled, and I'm using counseled very um, loosely. So we offer um, support to women who have to do surgery, right? Fibroid removal, um, any type of surgery related to fibroid treatment. Um, we've never had anybody come to us, PCOS related. But she had fibroids and she had to do the open myomectomy, the abdominal myomectomy. And so we supported her through, and um, we give you tips, you know, how to cope, the questions to ask, that kind of thing, just to prepare you. We pray and we support and encourage. So she was the first person that we did that kind of work with. And then she went on to have mm -hmm. twins, naturally, after having um, fibroids removed. Um, through her experience with us, she actually began doing work in fertility counseling. And she has committed to continuing to support us, which she has demonstrated. So for those who may really be having that challenge, we are just letting you know you can look out for the communication from us. And we endorse what Dr. Armstrong is saying. Seek the, find someone that you can talk to because you need, you need the empathy. You need to know that someone listens, someone understands and they can encourage you along the process because it's not a one and done and it's not something that can essentially be fixed overnight and it brings us right back to the point of how different everyone is and how the cases can differ. Um, I remember in the first session um, Dr. Armstrong talked about it today as it relates to exercising and, 
and getting healthier. And we had one person sharing that they have four children now. They were diagnosed with PCOS and told they could not have children. And they had a baby as recent as December. And she even jokingly said, you know, I have started making the drink. And every time I decide I'm going to exercise and try to lose weight, bam, I get pregnant. So me and exercising and losing weight again, right? And so it's really an individual thing. Um, also for us at Fibroid Awareness TT, we are big on faith. So we believe in God. And so faith is also a part of our story and our journey. And so we encourage persons to really have a positive mindset and dig deep spiritually. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's complex. It's not one step. It's um, different levels to it. And we are just here really to give the information and the support right? So hormonal imbalance, how can I regulate it? I think we touched on that as it relates to um, getting the expert support specific to hormonal imbalance, but things like um, regulating a diet, regulating stress triggers, regulating um, the toxins that you expose your body to, those are also things that you can do, but you have to know where the, Im, the hormonal imbalance starts so that you can treat with it, right? It's one thing to say you have a hormonal imbalance, but where does it start? What are the, the hormones that are imbalanced, right? Um, also, apart from those mentioned, what other effects does hormonal imbalance have on the body? I'm not sure if you want to touch on that, Dr. Armstrong, if you could speak broadly to how hormonal imbalance could affect the body. Um, but for me, I think it's, it's broad. It could go all sorts of places. The thyroid, you know, thyroid function, thyroid disease. It's, it's really broad, but let the... Um, and the thing is, with polycystic ovarian syndrome, you're seeing where it affects your entire body in terms of uh, being at risk for metabolic syndrome. And the thing about it is that this is a cluster of conditions. So it can affect your heart, so cardiovascular, heart disease in terms of getting stroke, in terms of getting diabetes mellitus, and also in terms of high cholesterol. So it actually affects your entire body. And as Corey said, imbalance in your hormones could cause increased thyroid or hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. So it affects each area of your body. Yeah. Um, any other questions for us, ladies? Oh, I just want to say, in, I know our culture in Trinidad and Tobago, when we, in terms of planning for pregnancy, it's very important that when you find out that you become pregnant and you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, to please go by the obstetrician, mainly because you want to decrease your risk of having gestational diabetes mellitus and pregnancy-induced hypertension, because they are going to start certain medications to decrease your risk. It is because that these conditions in pregnancy, they can cause all sorts of things to go wrong in terms of baby and mommy. So with gestational diabetes mellitus, you're at the risk of having a big baby. This can increase the risk of having cesarean section. And if you have vaginal delivery, it can increase the risk of having a shoulder dystocia, big word meaning that the baby's shoulders cannot be passed through the vaginal canal and can be stuck. And the midwives and the doctor has to do certain maneuvers. In terms of gestational diabetes mellitus, also increase the risk of having stillbirth. Stillbirth meaning that anytime during your pregnancy, your baby can suddenly die, unfortunately. So it's very important that once you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, that you seek the care of an obstetrician or any doctor so that they can refer you where possible. All right, so um, one Nikki raised her hand. Um, Nikki, you could go ahead and ask a question. Hi, good day, everybody. Um, Hi. I'm suffering from PCOS, right? And for last year, I saw my period twice for the year. And this year, it only came in February. Now, I was taking metformin, and I had an allergic reaction to it. And I was assigned to a dietitian and still wasn't working. Now, in the space of February, I know I'm getting pain, like strong pains, and I am thinking, okay, it's coming, and then when I look, it's nothing. So I'm wondering, I search on Dr. Google, and Dr. Google telling me all kind of stuff. 
Oh, we might be um over on cancer. No, I starting to panic because then I saying to myself, well, you know, it's a while. No, and even though I know that is PCOS, it's just making me a little um scared. Mm-hmm. So, so um, what's your name? Nikia Sandy. Nikia, do you see a doctor or gynecologist? I was actually, you was my um, gynae <laughs> in the oh, clinic, no. gynae doctor in the clinic. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I made an appointment to see a doctor mm. um, for the 26th of May. So I'm going the best to thing I would have done, I would have brought your period. So I would have given you like Provera or oral contraceptive pills and bring mm. on that withdrawal bleed because you need to have that bleed, right? Okay. Because your endometrial lining is just getting thicker and thicker because it has been four to five months. You haven't had a period. And then Mm -hmm. your body, well, your brain is sending messages to your ovaries. Those ovaries are releasing progesterone and estrogen hormone through the bloodstream, but there isn't that feedback mechanism. So therefore, you need the hormonal component to start off a period. And I also want to just throw in again, Lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. We have to be healthy. I'm not a bastion of health. Eh? Those around me could tell you, but I there are certain things I really try to do and try to avoid eating and exposing myself to. And we just have to encourage the lifestyle changes as well. So we have to really zone in on the diet. And when I say toxins, I mean even things like bleach and the things that we use, they get into our system. So we have to try to be as healthy and organic as possible. We have three questions that came in, Dr. Armstrong. One was, how about PICA? Are you more at risk when you have PICOs and fibroids? Um, Then we also have, well, it's two questions. How long after an abdominal myomectomy surgery can there be sexual intercourse and when is pregnancy recommended? Of course, and Hani asks, what are your views on doing QI? Q-U-A-I. What are the views on doing what? Why? I'm not sure what Kwai is. Yeah, what are your views on Zong Kwai? Oh, Zong Kwai, right. Oh, okay, sorry. I saw an eye in the dong there. Forgive me. Okay. <laughs> but go ahead, Dr. Armstrong. So we have the question about Pika, uh, the question about um, abdominal myomectomy, how long after you can have sexual intercourse and when is pregnancy recommended? So the compulsive disorder that you normally know, eat a lot of foods, right? I'm yeah, not sure. You're not if... supposed to eat like paper, things like right. that. Yeah. Value. I'm guilty here now, so I just... Uh, you do that. It. Normally with persons with anemia, normally have pico. Yeah. Yeah, pico. <laughs> and I think that's the link. Yeah. Because if you and that's the link. I because with picos, you have abdominal. So and with picos, you have abnormal uterine bleeding. So therefore you will be eaten. Well, you, you will be craving these things because of anemia. Yeah. So there is a risk of having pica. Yeah, so pica is that craving for things that really don't have nutritional value. Ice, um, even some magnesia, um, dirt in pregnancy. I've heard of the dirt or the sand, um, paper, yeah, Corey, you. I have a 6 p.m. class and I have okay. seven minutes to get ready seven for this. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, but I want to answer the question. Is there any possible way that I could type the question and um, the answer to the questions? Sure, okay. we could save, um, we could definitely save the chat. This question is related to the um, sexual intercourse. Which question? The don't quite question as well as uh, pregnancy after question. myomectomy. Yes, yeah. Yes, okay, no problem. No problem at all. You could type it. Um, Trisha and Honey, I'll definitely ask you guys to subscribe so that we could get your contact information so we could send Dr. Armstrong's feedback on the questions as it relates to Dong Pai. And uh, somebody is confessing they just had a bowl of ice. They are. <laughs> Who is that person? Having anemia. Who has anemia? That's it privately, but I will just say it's your cousin. Mm-hmm. Akila. Oh, come on now. <laughs> she just had a bowl of ice. And um, so those are the two questions. The 
how long after my abdominal myomectomy surgery can there be sexual intercourse and when is pregnancy recommended? Um, Trisha said she subscribed already. Wonderful. Just um, you could just type in your surname to me privately so I know once we go have more than one Trisha. So we can send you that answer. And um, honey as well. Honey, please subscribe so that we could also send the information to you. All right. So um Ladies and gentlemen, we actually are wrapping up at the time we, we try to push like at least an hour and a half. Um, thank you all very much, Dr. Armstrong, before I go. All right, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Armstrong, we're closing remarks. Um, so I enjoyed this presentation and the interaction with everyone. Nice seeing a lot of people that I know um, and that I treated. And uh, we'll definitely have to do another session. So I'm not sure if any one of y'all can get in contact with Corey, so myself, and just give suggestions on the next topic that y'all want to discuss. Mm -hmm. Oh, See, thank you, Diva. <laughs> we, oh, okay. Sorry, I have to run because of my class. <laughs> no problem. So Aki wasn't confessing. Somebody said it to her mistakenly. No ice, no ice. Okay. Uh, with that said, um, thank you so much, Marielle. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ladies as well, thank you very much for joining us. Our handles on social media are at Fibroid TT. So that's F-I-B-R-O-I-D-T-T. -T. That's our Instagram handle. And Facebook, it's Fibroid Awareness, Trinidad and Tobago. I know this is back to front, but you should see this look. This is the cover photo, the profile photo, the logo. Also, our website is www.ttconfidenceproject.org, O-R-G. So you could subscribe there. Persons who may be interested in learning more about the organization and possibly volunteering once things open up. And I mean, even online, if you, you know there are strengths that you could volunteer at this time, you can click on the area that speaks to becoming a Fibroid Awareness City Ambassador and you can submit your information there. For those who need the information, um, indicate when you're subscribing, why you're, why you're subscribing the information that you want. And I think that's it in a nutshell. We touched on mental health and as promised during our last session, we want to do a sun, like a Sunday afternoon. So more than likely it will be the Sunday, the last Sunday in this month because May 28th is actually the International Day of Action for reproductive health, women reproductive health. And it's something that I wanted us as Fibroid TT to actually commemorate in some way. Of course, COVID has put a damper on how we can congregate, but because of technology, we can still connect. And so with Akila Riley Richardson, who presented during the last session last week, we will be having an evening just dedicated to women um, talking about the, the mental aspect of dealing with perceived infertility and just the challenges because of reproductive health issues. Um, we continue to provide an open and a safe space. So once we get that information and we firm up the dates, of course, we will begin promoting, we will start sharing. So once you subscribe to our website, you will get that information. And then of course, through all the channels that we use, social media, um, WhatsApp, and we just put the information out there and you could join us. More than like the session, because it may be a bit more sensitive, we'll have a password, but we'll definitely be using the Zoom platform. So you can look out for that information and just join us on that Sunday evening, we, um, maybe around 4.35, around that time in the afternoon, once, you know, the Sunday lunch settle in and that kind of thing. And then, of course, keep your, your questions and those things that you want us to touch on. You could always message us. Um, we already have two that we would be looking at. 
and that's fertility, broader fertility and endometriosis. So thank you again very much for joining us, taking the time out to um, spend some time with us. We truly, truly appreciate it because we know your time is valuable and we hope you have a wonderful week, a wonderful, wonderful week and all the best. And of course, we're open, reach out to us and we share and talk as much as we possibly can. All right. So bye, ladies. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.